Hi there, Frank Shia here, and uh, we're doing class three of My World of Oriental Rugs. If you missed the first couple of classes, I used to call this class uh, The World of Oriental Rugs, and then I realized that I pretty much am limited to what I know, so I changed the title to My World of Oriental Rugs. Uh, the first two classes we dealt with uh, where rugs are woven and the maps and so on and so forth. And then we dealt a lot with the real early history of rugs uh, from the Pizaric carpet, which is known to be 500 BC, up through uh, the Safavid dynasty, which is the great, uh, the first great rug renaissance uh, uh, in the 1600s, essentially. So class three is where things get exciting because this, this class in class four, we're going to talk about how rugs are woven, the loom, the wool, the design, the dyes, et cetera, et cetera, the knots that are tied and how it's all done. And then, uh, and then after that, we're going to look at, you know, class five, I think, is on uh, uh, rugs from the, uh, the second great renaissance. And then class six is rugs from the second, uh, third great renaissance. And we'll get into all of those things. But for now, let's take a look at the construction of rugs. Now, I showed this slide uh, while we were talking about the Safavid dynasty last week. And I showed it because I just wanted to help you understand that a rug, um, it, the designer or the maker of the rug is very critical in the rug being done right. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of Frank Lloyd Wright. And you've probably seen one of Frank Lloyd Wright's houses. And when you look at one of Frank Lloyd Wright's houses, you don't think to yourself, oh, that was a great bricklayer, or that was a great plumber, or a great electrician. You think of the guy that designed the whole house. He had the vision for the whole thing. And then he's the one that chooses who's going to lay the brick, who's going to build the frame, who's going to do the electric. He, everything else goes underneath him, and that's the same way it is with rugs. Whether it's a village rug, that is, you know, it's a village, and they weave rugs, and they all are part of it, and they decide on what it's going to look like, or a tribal rug, which is essentially a village, but uh, uh, no, they're nomadic people or better ones, and they travel a lot or whether it's made for commercial production, which most rugs after 1880 were, uh, they were made to be produced to sent to the US or to Europe or wherever. And um, they're the ones that call the shots. They're the Frank Lloyd Wrights of the Oriental rug. And, or, or just an artist that decides he wants to produce a beautiful rug and he's got an idea of what he wants to do. They're the ones that have to Decide on who's going to weave it, who the master weaver is, what the cartoon or graph is going to look like, what, what kind of wool they're going to use, how tight the rug is going to be. They have to choose the, they have to build the loom, choose the foundation, choose the type of wool and make sure it's produced properly, make sure the dyes are produced properly, and then that the wool is dyed properly. And they're the ones that have to do all of these things. They produce the rug. And then they do all the finishing touches, which we'll come back to that later on. But so let's take a look. Uh, first of all, I want to show you a photograph of a loom. Now, I have a, uh, a better loom that we'll show you in terms of getting up close and personal with it. But this is a, a loom. This actually, this loom is in our shop, actually. And uh, we got it in, uh, in the mid 80s when we had some girls from Romania come to our shop to, uh, d we, they were here for, I think, two weeks, and we did a, a sort of a oriental rug uh, display, and we took it around the state of Virginia, several different places, and uh, people came to watch them weave rugs, and they, when they came, there was only the border on this rug, and they wove that much while they were with us, um, and this is a cartoon, which we'll explain in a minute. This is the warp threads and there's weft threads and these are the little knots they're gonna tie. But so how does a rug, you know, go back to this again. We have a maker, he decides on a rug, then he decides on the design of the rug and he decides how fine the rug is going to be. So after deciding those, that, that helps them decide uh, what kind of foundation it's going to be and how many 
warp threads per inch it's going to have and what kind of wool or perhaps they're going to use silk or some other thing what kind of dyes then he makes a graph or a cartoon that is a picture of what the rug's going to look like so there is the cartoon which is essentially one fourth of this rug so then when they open it up to the other side it's the other half of that and then they flip the whole thing over and you have the top of the rug so that's how the design is is made so let's talk a little bit more about the design so this is what's known as a cartoon or some people will just call it a graph but it's a cartoon where they're and then this one you see they're laying out the border and coming up with a design here's a picture of another one uh i was in a room very similar to this exactly like this actually where they're just giant sheets of graphs sheets of graph paper and they're just painting in everything and then they know exactly uh, the scale of how the rug should be woven. So there's the graph paper and they just go ahead and lightly cover over it with the design of the rug. Now, uh, nowadays, this is all done on computers. So what's nice about that, then they can say, okay, make this border background navy blue. So they change all of that to navy blue. Make this field background uh rows so they change that to rows make this corner uh light blue so they make that light blue they can go and change everything around to exactly what they want it to look like so you see and then once that's done they have a close-up and you can see every one of these little dots is actually a knot uh there again that that's what it looks like and each of these is a little knot so so then what the designer has to come up with is what the rug looks like. And what you're seeing here are some basic rug design components. So real simply, you have a medallion, you have a field, you have the main border, then you have uh, what's known as outer guard border and inner guard border, and you have these corners which are known as spandrels. So in a typical rug, here's your medallion, your field, your spandrels, the border, the inner band and outer band or outer uh, guard border. Um, in a prayer design, which we'll talk about some, uh, it's, I mean, one out of every 30 rugs is a prayer design. So it's not like they're, it's really important, but the only difference is in the feet. So the border is the same and they have the inner uh, outer band and inner band, but in the field they have uh, what's known as a mirab. So instead of the medallion and the field, etc., they have just a mirab, and they don't have spandrels. And supposedly this was to point the rug toward uh, ah Mecca. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, um, now what I don't have a diagram of here is sometimes they do an open field and in an open field you wouldn't have the spandrels and the medallion uh it would just be one big open field with some sort of design on the field um but this is how they design a rug so they come up with this design and they put it into something like this and then they give this to the weaver and say weave this rug and I want 200 knots per square inch and I want you know this assortment of colors and they tell them what colors etc cetera, etc cetera. and I want it if it's 500 knots per square inch they might use linen for the warp and weft instead of wool or the uh, instead of cotton or they might use silk or whatever so uh, this is real interesting this is uh, a typical hariz that's the type of rug it's a hariz rug from Persia Remember, if it was made in India, we would call it a Hariz design woven in India. But in this case, this is a Hariz rug woven in Persia. So here is the basic outline of this motif. You've got the spandrels, you've got the field, and in this case, you have one medallion inside another medallion. So watch this. Hexagon of red ground, that is a six-sided figure of red ground, part with partially stepped uh those little steps along the edges here 
uh, two superimposed star-shaped medallions, a center medallion, which is decorated with tulips, and the others uh, with cypresses and ears of corn, uh, grains, ears of grain. So here's the ears of grain and here's the ears of corn. And a field which is decorated with flowers and the corner usually has a vase of some kind. You know, it does, it's stylized, you don't see it that clear. But what's interesting, and um, the reason I showed you this is because when I came across this diagram, I was fascinated that every, almost every Harese I have has this basic motif. Now the border may be navy, the border may be red, the field may be navy, the field might be ivory, the corners could be navy or red, or, but, but the basic outline, this diagram is the same. So this is what the weaver has to start with, the, the maker, the designer of the rug. He has to come up with a, uh, a design and the components for that design, and then he has to choose the colors that he's going to use. So um, with that, let's just diverse for a minute because this is kind of interesting. I'm gonna, you'll understand why in a minute, but I'm diverting to uh, when I greet someone at the door, they come in the shop and they say, hi, I'm looking for a rug. I don't really know what I'm looking for. I have some questions we ask to help a customer identify what, what they like in a rug, what, what you might like. So here's the questions I ask. Are you looking for floral or geometric? Are you looking for a tight pattern or a loose design? Do you want all over or a medallion? Do you like reds and blues or earth tones or perhaps pastels? And then you just ask them their size. And obviously you have to ask them what kind of money. But you're, um, you'd be amazed at how we can go from 100 rugs to, well, it comes down to you probably like one of these 10 rugs. Just like that, we can go from a choice of 100 to 10 by just filling out these blanks. And let me give you an example of what some of these are. So when we say floral versus geometric, if you notice that even though there's flowers in it, everything is a little bit uh, up and down, straight, straight lines, as opposed to floral where there, everything is curvilinear and there's lots of flowers in the room. So that's the first question, floral or geometric? Usually floral is a little more formal. Geometric, although it can be done in formal places, it's a lot more sometimes informal. Um, then you want to ask them, do you like an all-over pattern? Well, this is an all-over pattern. I'm going to show you a couple others. But this one is what we'd call an all-over pattern with a big design. In other words, it's not real small, a lot of florals that tend sometimes to get a little busier. So this is all-over with a big design, again, all over with a big design, but here's all over with a real tight design, little floral design, but see how tight it is? And so um, these are all the questions I asked them, all over with a more tight design. And then you want to ask them, do you want pastels, you know, the beautiful soft colors like these, or, you know, uh, an ushak like one of these with the pastels, uh, I must have skipped a couple of slides here. Well, I, I thought I had a couple of slides about, because the other question would be, you know, do you want uh, reds and blues or do you want rust colors or, um, and because certain rugs come in rust, certain rugs come in reds, certain rugs come in the pastel color. So you asked all those questions and that's why the design is so important. That's why I stuck this in because it all has to do with the design of the rug. The construction of rug, the knot and the loom. And of course, this is based on the design and the desired intricacy of the rug. So if I want it to be really fine or if I want it to be loose wool. So here's another diagram of a loom. And in this one, I think you can see a little clearer uh, all of the aspects to the loom. Now, the most important thing for you to know would be these threads here, which are known as the warp threads or warp strings, the strings that go up and down. So when they're weaving a rug, they build this big loom and then they run these warp threads up and down. All of this is based on the design and how tight 
you want the rug to be. It would never be like this. There'd always be maybe 30 warp threads or 20 warp threads in every inch across this. So uh, this is just done for design so you can see how things are. Now, the next thing you'd wanna know is the weft threads, which are the threads that go across this way. Generally, in most rugs, there's two or three weft threads between every row of knots. So you see that design. So when they, they run the warp threads, whoops, I'm sorry. They run the warp threads and then uh, usually they'll do a little bit of flat weaving right across as they start the rug. And then the first row of knots, one knot at a time, ivory, ivory, rust, ivory, rust, ivory, all the way across. And, and then they'll run some weft threads and then they'll tie another row of knots. And this is how a rug is woven side by side. So along the edges, we call this overcasting, but that's really not something we need to talk about to, right now. As I said, this along the bottom, it's usually a kaleem. And when they cut it off the, the, uh, the loom, these threads you see here are what we call the fringe. The fringe is, is basically the warp threads that go all the way through the entire rug. One of the ways you can tell a uh, Karistan or machine made rug is they're not made on a loom. So they actually don't have warp and weft threads, weft threads as we talk about them. And so a lot of times you can look at the rug and realize that the, um, the fringe is the fake fringe that's been added on afterward. Now it's not a hundred percent accuracy, but that's a pretty good telltale of a, a machine made rug. Um, this is known as a leash rod and it's attached to every other warp thread. So that when, so when you release the leash rod, you can run a row of weft th threads, which would go over the first one, under the second one, over the first one, under the next one, and so on. Then you pull this out and you run another weft thread and it's going the exact opposite way and that's what actually tightens the knots up. So um, so this is the loom. Uh, now we talked in our definition in class one about the types of rugs, the piled rugs versus flat woven rugs. Flat woven rug is known as a kaleen. There's other, another type that's known as a sumac and this is a pile rug which is what you know 80, 90 percent, 95 percent of our rugs are pile rugs but uh, this is the sumac, which is another style of flat weave. So in the kaleem, you can flip it over and use one side or the other. In a sumac, it looks all raggedy on one side and it's just flat on the other side. So um, those are the different styles of weave. But So here is the, um, you know, sort of a close-up of a loom. So here we have these warp threads I was telling you about. So at the beginning of the rug, they run several weft threads, you know, a bunch of them, and it looks like a kaleem weave, and then they start the knot. Now, in this, we'll get into it in a minute, but in this uh, rug, that's called a uh, sinna knot, and I will show you the difference between the two in a minute, although it doesn't matter that much whether it's a sinna knot or a gori's knot, but so, so they run the, weft, the warp threads, then they run some weft threads, then they tie a knot, they tie another knot, they tie another knot, then they run more weft threads, then they tie, tie more knots. Uh, so that's the warp, the pile of the rug, the overcasting along the sides, the kaleem at the end, the knots, and the weft threads, okay? So the foundation. So foundations, cotton versus wool, and then of course down at the bottom you also have linen or silk. Um, usually almost all rugs, are, I would say 80% of rugs are woven with cotton foundation. It's stronger, thinner, limited stretching, even shrinkage. The rug will keep its shape and the rug will lie flat. If you use wool, the problem with wool is it has a tendency to stretch and uh, pull. And so the rug will get out of shape and you have to use thicker pieces of wool to make sure that it's strong enough. So cotton is stronger. Uh, uh, now, some rugs, if they're gonna weave a really fine rug, 
they'll use maybe linen as the warp and weft or even silk because these are much stronger. So it can be a very thin piece of string as opposed to, uh, you know, cotton. If you've ever flown a kite, you know that cotton string, you can, if it's too thin, you can easily take it with your hands and just break it apart and it breaks. But if, if you've had a piece of linen string, just the same size as the cotton string, you can pull very hard and not be able to break it apart. And the same goes with silk. So they have to choose their foundation. So he, here's, uh, there's what, you know, just an example. I, of course, if we were in class in person, I'd be able to show you these uh, things up close, but this is a uh, linen and this is a wool foundation. And of course, here's the cotton foundation, probably not the best example, but I use this because it shows you the big thick cotton. And this is a silk foundation woven on a rug that has probably uh, 800 knots per square inch. So it had to be silk to make that many, uh, to make this warp and weft threads thin enough so that they could get that many knots per square inch. So <clears throat> let's talk about these knots a little bit. The simple way to look at it is there's the Gordy's knot. So it comes down in between two warp threads, down underneath, over two warp threads, down the other side, and then back up in between the two. Uh, now, it doesn't look very tight, but the thing is when you run those weft threads, the way I was telling you that you run the weft threads over one warp and below the next one and so on and so forth, when you pull it all tight, it, become, it looks more like this. So you can see that while it doesn't look like a very tight knot there, it becomes a very tight knot when you, when you weave the rug. This other knot, so this is called the Turkish knot or the Gordy's knot. And as I said, the truth is it, it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. Some rugs are woven with Gordy's, some rugs are woven with Cine knots, and it, it doesn't make that big a difference. Probably one of the differences is that you know uh, what cities did what. So looking back, we can say, well, I think this is a Kerman rug because it has a Kerman design, but also you can study the knots and realize it's a Cine knot and Kerman used Cine knots. So a Cine, instead of this, where the, the, it goes down in between two and over the two and then up in between the two, Cine goes down in between one, over one and down underneath the next and then up outside of it. But when it comes together, it looks like that. Now, no, tightness of knot versus knots per square inch. This is a big deal. When I went into the business, I, I worked for my father before uh, we opened up the shop in Williamsburg. But when I worked for my father, I was, I, they always told me the only thing that counted was how many knots per square inch. And I thought that was it, you know. So I would look at a rug and if it looked like there was a lots of knots per square inch, I would say, this is a really good rug. Well, that's a little deceptive, and I'm going to try to show you how, but it's difficult to show you, you know, uh, on uh, slides like this. Uh, but imagine you had, well, I have an example I'll show you right here. This is a, uh, the string that we use to tie rugs. And actually, if you look at it, 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 is, uh, it has three strands of string tied together to make it a good, strong thing. Now imagine, like for instance, right here is the knot we tied to, um, you know, put the loop to tie the rugs. But that is a very, very tight knot, okay? Now imagine if you took a thinner piece, so I'm just going to take one of the three strands and I will tie a knot with this. But notice I'm not pulling real hard, so it's not really a tight knot. But if all you're looking at is how many knots per square inch, you could compare the two of these and say that, uh, there, wow, there's more knots in this rug than that rug. So um, it must be a better rug because it has more knots per square inch. But that's really not the issue. The issue, as if you look here, is how tight the knot is tied. This, though it's a smaller strand of yarn, is a looser knot than this, which is a bigger strand. So if you just looked at the knot, 
you may think that this is better, but the fact is the tighter knot is a better rug. This is a big thing because people always want to know how, how many knots per square inch. Well, you know what? One of my best selling rugs are the Harris rugs. That's the design I showed you before with the uh, superimposed medallions and all of that. Harris are one of my best selling rugs. The average Harris has 80 to 120 knots per square inch. Not necessarily that fine. They lasted all these years because they used a really good wool and they pulled the knots really tight. And that's what makes the rug last. So this is a big deal learning and understanding this. And I don't know, you'd have to come into the shop and let me show you some and get the feel of some. But you know, back in this 80s, the a real popular rug was the Pakistan Bokara rug. And they looked so fine. They used this real fine, silky kind of wool, real thin strands. But the bottom line is the rugs wore out quickly. The reason they wore out was because they weren't tightly woven. The knots weren't real tight. They, it, there were a lot of knots per square inch, but they were loose knots per square inch, as opposed to a Harris that has not as many knots per square inch, but they're real tight knots per square inch. So, um, so the, you know, here's what they do. They just weave one row of knots at a time, and then they have a tool like this, which they, uh, they run the weft threads and they pound them down like that. And that's what you see. So here is, you know, a loom, probably this looks more like a nomadic loom uh, or a village loom. So this could be in someone's house. And here they're, you know, they've been asked to weave this rug with this motif and there they're weaving the warp threads, the weft threads, the leash bar. Uh, this is the, um, uh, this is the yarn used for the weft threads. Here are the yarns that they're using for the weaving of the rug. And they tie one knot at a time, and that's how they weave a rug. There's my girls uh, when at the shop, and they're there weaving the rug. That's that same diagram we showed you earlier. And here they are weaving on the loom I showed you a picture of before. Um, this was really fun when we had them. The only funny thing is that there actually five people came. So there were the two girls. And uh, there was another lady who was in charge of design of all Romanian rugs. And then there was a man who was the um, in charge of weaving, one of the CEOs of the Oriental rug business in Romania. And then they had a KGB agent to come and make sure they didn't leave. The three ladies stayed with my wife and I in our house. And uh, we put the other ones up in a motel. Um, the KGB agent mostly played tennis with one of my salesmen for the whole two weeks, but that was, he was really into tennis. So, but uh, it was kind of fun. It was very interesting. Um, so here's another photograph of them sitting in a loom. So obviously, um, so in a thing like this, you know, sometimes I will in the by the eighties and nineties and 1900, they had, they had realized they can, you know, build a warehouse and put together like 20 of these looms in a warehouse and just hire people to come and work on the rugs. So it was, you know, the hence the commercialization and of the in the industry part of the Oriental rugs. There they are. There's the cartoon. Here's another this is the border cartoon. So this is probably an all-over pattern that they're weaving with the border. And they're tying one row at a knot, one knot at a time you know, all the way across and so on and so forth. Uh, there, Here's another, this is village weaving and she's, you know, as you can see, she's got the loom set up on her back porch and, but there's the cartoon and they're just weaving. I'm, it's kind of interesting. Um, she, this may be a side, a little different style loom where she's weaving from side to side instead of up and down, but Generally speaking, it's it's always uh, up and down. So you just keep, and on a big loom like this, they have a roll bar at the top and the bottom. And um, well, at the bottom. And so as they keep weaving, they roll the bar. So the loom comes down lower, the rugs rolled up on the bar and the loom comes down lower. Um, so uh, here's just an interesting aspect. You know, people ask me all the time, why do uh, rugs have a light and dark end? And it's real simple if, if you understand, they're tying a knot 
and pulling it down, tying a knot, pulling it down, tying a knot. So the rug is going to have a, uh, you know, you can do it this way and it's with the pile or you can do it this way and it's against the pile. So essentially that's what it is, looking at the rug with the pile or looking at the rug against the pile or into the pile. So if you're looking at it with the pile, it's gonna look lighter. And if you look at it into the pile, it's going to look darker. Um, so here, you know, I mean, if you wanna count knots, it's, you can do it and I'll teach you how to do it. But again, it's very important to understand that it's not just the number of knots per square inch, but how tight the, rug, the knots are. Every knot has two loops on the back. However, sometimes you only see one bump on the back because of the depressed warp. So the center knots, uh, you only see one um, bump on the back. I'll show you what that means. So uh, this is the center knot. So each one of these is one knot. There's, so that's a red knot, a pink knot, a pink knot, a white knot, red knot, red knot. And, you know, if you wanted to count per square inch, you just actually, both of these photographs are one square inch. So this rug has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And I'm just going to guess that it's 15. So it's 15 by 15. So it has about 200, 200, you know, 25 or 230 knots per square inch in this rug. Now, this is a Gordy's knot. So when you count this, you see how, look at that green, there's two sides to it. So that's, those two are only one knot. Those two are only one knot. So here you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine knots across. So it's, if it's the same, if it's nine by nine, there's only 81 knots per square inch in this. So that's how you count the knots if, if you're into doing that. So Here's a silk piece that I own. I sold a couple of years ago. It's an old um, uh, uh, silk Gordy's. Um, but here's, you know, here's one inch of a yardstick. And we put the one inch in there. Look at this. So you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, probably 27 or 28 knots per, uh, across. If it's, uh, they usually are, it's probably 28 by 28. So that's almost 800 knots per square inch. This, of course, is on silk. I mean, it's it's silk, and it's it was a silk warp and weft as as well. So here's a here's another silk piece. Piece. This is a hierarchy. There's a close up of it of this hierarchy. But here again, if you count it, it's probably about 700 knots per square inch. Very very finely woven rug. And I might add, these pieces are very tightly woven as well. So not just knots per square inch, but each knot is tied very tight. Finally, uh, to wrap this up, I'll just uh, tell you one other kind of interesting note when it comes to weaving rugs. We call them lazy lines. I'm sure that's probably not politically correct at this point in, in our great world that we live in. But Imagine th this is a photograph of a nine by 12 rug. So there's about nine feet across right there. So you don't have one weaver who has to constantly move down across the thing. It's like that loom I showed you where there were three people sitting. There's probably three or four people sitting on this and they're weaving. And so they're weaving across and you know this person weaves over to about here and this person weaves over to about here and this person, so three people. Every time they meet, it's a little tiny bit off. Now, on the top of the rug, when there's plenty of pile, you don't see that offness. But if the rug's worn down, in the case of this, this rug is about 1870. So it's a very early rug and it is a, a low. But you have these lines like that and that, and here's one here, and here's one here. And it's where the weavers meet. So a lot of times people will go, well, there's a repair in that rug. Well, it's actually not a repair at all. It's just where the two weavers met. And here's an interesting thing. I, I'm gonna talk about this 
uh, I think next week when we talk about dyes. But, you know, when you have a dye, you, you have some yarn and you dye, you want a beautiful rust color. So you come up with your uh, batch of rust, you dye the yarn, then you run out of dye. So you make some more dye, you dye some more yarn. The two spools of yarn look exactly alike, but over the years, they may begin to fade differently. So what happens is the lines like this, where they're weaving across and then they use the different spool of wool and over the years, it faded differently, and that's known as an abrash. And here, one weaver was using one spool of yarn, and the other weaver was using another spool of yarn. So where they met, the lazy line highlighted an abrash as well. So it's kind of unique. Anyway, I think that's all for today. Yep, that's uh, that's all we're going to discuss today. I hope you enjoyed some things on this. And don't forget, if you have questions, feel free to uh, sh uh, just email us at info at shia.com. And we'll be glad to answer any questions or you can come by the shop. We're right on Jamestown Road, 1325 Jamestown Road. And uh, we'd love to you know, show you around. The loom that we showed you today is upstairs. It's sitting right there with the cartoons and all the tools that they use to work on the rugs. and. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed today and we'll see you next week when we talk about the uh, types of wool and the types of dyes and it'll be interesting. Thank you. Bye-bye.